Hey, we're so glad you decided to join us on YouTube. You're about to hear a message from our teaching team. We hope this message helps equip you for freedom and to find purpose in your everyday life. We stream our online services every Sunday. You can visit us at freedomhouse.cc slash live to connect with us and become part of our online campus. We know that you're gonna enjoy this message you're about to watch. So we're in this series called Camouflage. I wanna tell you a story. I, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Many of you know that. And uh, I went to middle school called Moody Middle School, Charles H. Moody Middle School. Um, it was the year that they changed it. It used to be you would go first through sixth grade in elementary school, and then seventh and eighth in middle school, and then ninth through twelfth. Well, they changed it the year that I went through first through K, K through fifth grade, and then sixth, seventh, and eighth in middle school. Well, I went to middle school. The first year, everything was great. Second year, everything changed in my middle school. They started busing in kids from all over different areas, and they changed kind of the way the, the community was. And what happened is there was a kid by the name of Brian who became the bully of Moody Middle School. Now, Brian was 27 years old in seventh grade. He had, his, he had three kids he would bring with him every day. I'm not kidding. This kid was the biggest kid I've ever seen, full beard, I, I, in my recollection. He had a six-pack of beer every time he came. Amazing. Um, I mean, this kid was huge. Now, I, on the other hand, was not a very big kid. I was about 5'10", and I weighed about 150 pounds. So I was a string bean. And this guy, Brian, picked on me every single day. Every day, he would pick on me. He would push me around. I'm going to kick your butt. He didn't say it that way, but that's what, you know, that's, you know, I won't give you the, the Greek translation of what he said, but... He would say all kinds of things about me and push me around. He did it to not just me, to all kinds of other kids. Until one day, I got tired of it. I mean, I really got tired of it. Sick and tired of this guy pushing me around. I'll never forget this, and I remember exactly. It was a sunny day like today. It was on the bus ramp, and I thought, I'm going to die. Today's a good day to die. <laughs> Let me go ahead and confront this bully. And so I walked up to Brian, he's about 6'2", you know, and I walked up to him and I said, listen, Brian, I am tired of you picking on me, let's just fight right now. And I just got it, I said, let's go, let's go. And I got real angry, you know, you know, this skinny kid just getting all, getting all angry with him and, and, you know, he probably thought I was a little crazy, I don't know, but he walked away from me and never, ever bothered me again. This whole series of camouflage is about exposing the bully the devil who is harassing you. And I'm going to tell you, if you will confront him with the word of God and the tools that we're going to give you today, he will walk away because he has been defeated. Amen? Amen. And so let's first of all talk about what it means, what happens when you become a believer. Because I think this is important because no matter how much you ignore the enemy, he's not going to go away. And every person in this room who's a follower of Jesus, who have decided to follow Jesus, you decided to follow Jesus, you are going to be confronted with a real enemy. I like what my wife says, and this is important to know. She said it, I didn't, so send her the emails. If you're not facing the devil head on, you're probably walking with him. And so what happens when you become a believer? What, what goes on in your life? First of all, you got to understand your sins are forgiven. Everybody say amen. That's really good. Past, present, and future sins. Every mistake, every problem, every thing that you bit, went through and will go through has already been paid for. You, you and I, because of our sins, we should go to hell, but Jesus went there for us. He became sin for you and I. Second thing that happens when we are, become believers is we're reunited with our Father. This is amazing. Now we have a connection with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when he died on the cross... The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. In other words, it was not man that could do it. It had to happen from God because it was torn from the top to the bottom, not the bottom to the top, which means that God is coming to earth. Are you following what I'm saying? And so we are now reunited with a father who loves us, a God who loves us. And now you don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go to someone in order to connect with God. You can go straight to the Father, directly to the Father. If you have a problem, if you have a need, go right to the very throne of God through 
Jesus Christ. The third thing is that our spirits are reborn. Before Christ, our spirits are dead. When you get reborn, when you get born again, that's what it means to be born again, now you have been given a brand new spirit, an alive spirit. Now, what's important about that? Because it's your spirit that communicates with God. It's your spirit that connects with God because he is spirit. And check this out. You are spirit. You are a spirit. You live in a body and you have a soul. But you are more a spirit. Now, this is important when it comes to what we're going to talk about today in the idea of spiritual warfare. The fourth thing that happened is that we have an eternity in heaven. Your address changes. Your eternal address goes from 649 Hell Boulevard to 777 Heaven's Lane, and we all live on the same street in your mansion, all right? And then the last thing you got to understand is that you are enlisted in a war. When you become a believer, you are now enlisted in a battle. Now, this is tough for us to understand as Americans because oftentimes we look at our Christian lives through a democratic mindset. We think God is a voted-in leader, because that's how we deal with God. That's how we deal with leaders. You know, so he doesn't have a four-year reign, by the way. Okay, he's not up for re-election. No, we are a part of what's called a kingdom now. You're not a part of a democracy. God is not a Republican, just so you know. Nor is he a Democrat or an independent or a socialist. He's God. And he's in control. Can I get an amen? Amen. And Jesus is his general, and you have been enlisted in a war. Now, let me just tell you a story to kind of help understand this. Um, And and the first thing you got to understand is that when Jesus came in Matthew chapter 10, it says this. It says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace. I came to get into a fight because that's what Jesus came to do. He understood this. Now, let me show you what this fight looks like. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we we see a story about a prophet by the name of Elisha, not Elijah. Elijah was his mentor. Elisha was his mentee, okay? Now, I'd encourage you to take some notes today. Write some things down. I'm going to give you some good points, some good things. I spent a lot of time on this message, so this is going to be a good one, I promise. I heard it last night. Phenomenal. (laughs) And so, so Elisha is now the prophet of the land. And he's telling secrets about, is, about the enemies of Israel. And one of those enemies is Aram. Aram was attacking Israel. And Elisha would come to the king of Israel and say, hey, listen, listen to this. He's going to show up here. You need to make sure you're ready for this. He's going to show up here. So he's telling secrets. Aram finds out that Elisha is telling all the plans before he even tells anybody about it. And Aram gets really mad. And so here's what happens. So one night... Watch what happens. One guy, Elisha. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army against one guy. Now, this is important to understand because if you feel like you are being attacked big time, you fall in the same category as Elisha. Understand, all of us are being attacked. And if you're doing big things for God, huge things for God, then the enemy is going to send his big army against you. And so he sends a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early to go to Starbucks, there were troops, horses, chariots everywhere. So he goes outside to get a couple lattes. He looks up, and there's all these chariots and horses. The king of Aram sent his whole entire army. And he comes back to Elisha. Didn't even get the coffee. Oh, sir, what will you do now? What will we do? What are we going to do? We're going to die. The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be afraid. Okay, this is important. You don't need to be afraid of the devil. Elisha told him, this is, this is awesome, I love this statement. For there are more on our side than on theirs. Let me give you a New Testament translation. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Isn't that good to know? For there are more on our side than on theirs. And then Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Man, that's awesome. Understand, there are more for you than are for the enemy. 
In other words, here's the way I look at it. We don't fight. We fight from victory, not for victory. You already run. If you haven't read the end of the book I did for you, we win. And so live that way. Live in a way that you are a winner. Face the enemy. Face your challenges and fight not for victory, but from victory. See, the truth is that I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love. Can I get an amen? Amen. Good place to clap right there. That's a good place. I love the Bible. I love the truth. And this is the truth. Because of, not because of anything we've done, thank goodness, because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. So what I want to do is I want to answer three questions for you. I want to answer three questions about this fight. I titled this message, Warfare 101. Warfare 101. So here's the first question that we need to understand is where is the battle? Where are we fighting this battle? Because oftentimes we get a little confused about where we fight. We think our battle is at the office. We think our battle is at home. Our battle is our neighborhood. Our battle is with our family. No, no, no. It doesn't exist there. Here's the way Paul said it in Ephesians 6. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, now watch this verse. This is real important to catch because if we think that the enemy is disorganized, he's not. He's very intentional. He's very organized and, and exact in what he does. And we find in this verse that he has rank and order within his army. So it says, we, wrestle, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay, the person next to you is not your enemy. Your husband is not your enemy. Your wife is not your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. It would be awesome if the devil wore a red suit, had horns and a pitchfork, and he was easy to recognize. But the Bible tells us he dresses up like an angel of light. And oftentimes, he puts on the skin of the people that are closest to you. And he uses them to influence things. And so check this out. It says, for there we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's the highest level. Whenever you see a list in the Bible, pay attention to it. Because God's going to show us something important about a specific topic or context. And so he says, we wrestle against principalities. So that's the highest level of the devil's army. Principalities, or called princes. Against power, second level. Against rulers of the darkness, third level. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness, fourth level. And where are they? They're in heavenly places. Here's the way Paul said it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I know a man who in, who in, Christ, in Christ who 14 years ago, <clears throat> what happened to Paul, and he doesn't t- he's not trying to brag on himself, 14 years before he wrote this, he was in a town called Lystra. And he was preaching the gospel And they stoned him, not this kind of stone, but they threw rocks at him. (laughs) And and they thought he was dead, and they threw him outside of the city. The Bible says the disciples surrounded him, and he came back to life. Within that period of time, he has this vision, and he goes somewhere. He says, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows such a one, talking about himself, was caught up to the Third heaven. Okay, now if Paul says there's three heavens, what's one and two? Wouldn't it be good to know what one and two heaven is, right? Well, the first heaven is the air we breathe right here. This is the first heaven. What we see right now in front of us. The reality that we live in. The second heaven is above Earth's atmosphere. So the universe, the galaxy, the stars, the planets, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is the spirit realm. It's just on the other side. There's no time in the spirit realm. That's where God lives. That's where God's presence is. How you interact with the third heaven or the spirit realm is by your faith. Our faith is the exchange that we make. Everything you need is in the spirit realm. Every miracle that you would ever need, the miracle you need right now. You say, I need some money. Yeah, there's money. In the spirit realm. 
There's provision in the spirit realm. There's healing in the spirit realm. There's also a fight going on in the spirit realm for you. Demons are fighting your angels for your attention right now. They're they're, they're fighting you. They're attacking you in the spirit realm. Every day you wake up, there's a battle that's going on, but it's happening in the spirit realm. So why is it important to know where the battle is? Because you got to know where to fight. So yelling at people on Facebook is not the answer. There's nothing spiritual about that. In every issue, catch this, every issue, every challenge, everything we deal with is a spiritual issue. It all starts in the spirit realm and then works itself out in the flesh, in the present tense, in the first heaven. Okay, so here's the second question. Who are we fighting? Who are we fighting? Now, let's, let's, let's talk about this. God exists outside of time. And so there's no beginning and end. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He, he exists outside of time. So what he did is outside of time. This is hard for us to understand because we think linear. We think tomorrow, the next day, yesterday. He doesn't think like that. He sees it all in front of him. And when we get to heaven, that'll be a good you know, class that we can go to is the whole understanding of time and not time. And so <clears throat> what, what happened is God made or had three archangels. The first archangel was a guy by the name of Gabriel. Everybody say Gabriel. Gabriel is the messenger angel. He was the guy who was given the job, still is today, given the job of carrying messages from heaven to earth. He told Mary, that she was going to have a baby. Woo, what are you talking about? That was Gabriel. Michael is the second archangel. His, his job is the fighter. He's the warrior angel. He's the one that you see all through the scriptures that's fighting. He fought for Moses' body. When Daniel was praying, Gabriel, uh, Gabriel came to him, but he said, Michael's been fighting all the way. We've been fighting all the way to try to get here. The third archangel that he created was a guy by the name of Lucifer. Lucifer which means morning star. And every time you see the word star in the Bible, typically it's involving an angel. Lucifer was the third archangel. And I like to look at Lucifer as God's personal assistant, his PA. He, he, his job was to cover the presence of God. He was in the presence of God until something happened. Now, it's interesting to note that angels have the ability to choose too. They're created beings. We'll talk more about that. But look what happens. Here's what happens to the devil. Lucifer became Satan. Lucifer became the accuser of the brethren. Lucifer became, Lucifer became the father of lies. He became our adversary. Those are all names of the enemy because of this, which is explained in Isaiah chapter 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O morning star? Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart. Now notice what he does. He said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will. Now when he says that, I will ascend into heaven, meaning I'm going to go to where you are. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be better than all the other angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. In other words, I'm going to be above you, God. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds. I will be most like, be like the most high God. Now, within this, you can see what the battle is for. So this is our enemy. What is the battle for? The battle is for glory. The devil wants God's glory. That's what pride is. Pride is taking what is for God for yourself. It's, it's disconnecting yourself, being independent from God and saying, I can do this on my own. So what happens is, is when you start saying things like, or when we start saying things like, I want the attention. I did this. The reason this business is successful because of my hard work. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you didn't do hard work, but you got to make sure that you give God his honor. Remember, we're a part of a kingdom, not a democracy. So if we can think that way, then we will live in an honoring mindset. And you always honor the king. You always honor who he is. You wouldn't be who you are without his leadership. So here's what God says in Isaiah 48. I will not give my glory to another. I'm not going to give my glory to anybody. I'm not sharing this. This weight, glory means weight, the kabod of God, the weight of God, the nature of glory. And so when pride sets in, we immediately disalign ourselves with God and align ourselves with the enemy. Now, what happened when Lucifer left, the Bible tells us in Revelation that he, a, a ta- his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Now, what is he talking about stars of heaven? Remember, I told you, whenever you see the word stars, it's talking about angels. You have an angel. Some of you have more angels than others because you need them. <laughs> but when he was cast out of heaven, his tail, I like how the Bible says his tail meaning that he's really good wordsmith. He can convince you. He, can conv- he convinced a third of the angels to come. Those are the demons that we deal with. Those are the demons of lust and fear and greed and pride and homosexuality and gender identity and racism. And all of those are the demonic realm. Now... What we need to know, we need to make sure we know some things about the enemy. Okay, so here's the first thing we need to know. He's a created being. Now, this is important because we often think the opposite of God is the devil. God does not have an opposite. There's a philosophy. There's a theological philosophy called dualism. Dualism means that every equal good has an opposite evil. Now, if that were true, if that philosophy were true, good could never win because every good would be offset by an evil. The opposite is true is tr- as well, that evil could never win because good would come into play whenever there was an evil. Now, this creeps into, follow me real quickly. I'm just gonna give you a little theological lesson. This is what creeps into religion. Because when we think our goods can supersede the evils or the bads that we've done, then we take it upon ourselves to think that we can be good enough to connect with God. So we start living into this philosophy of dualism where we think, well, if I can just do enough good, and this is how a lot of Christians think, if I can just do enough good, then it'll outweigh all the bad that I did. Listen to me, you'll never do enough good. That's why Jesus was good enough for you and me. Isn't that good to know? That's why when he went to the rich young ruler and the ruler, he said, he said, who are you calling good? No one's good but God. It's God's goodness that draws us to him. And so religion says, do enough good. Be a good person. You're gonna, you can go to lunch today. How are you gonna get to heaven? Just being good. No, no, you're not gonna get to heaven by being good. Now, you're going to get to heaven by having your faith in the one who was good for you, who died on the cross, who became sin, and took the consequences upon himself that we deserve. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. So when it comes to the devil, you got to understand he's a created being. The second thing we got to know is he's not everywhere. I know we say the devil's harassing me. No, it's probably not him. Personally, like he's not the one that's showing up at your house. All right, it's probably one of his cohorts, one of the third of heaven, stars of heaven, angels of heaven that he swept away from. So he's not omnipotent like God, omnipresent like God is. He also doesn't know everything. He's not omniscient like God. Now, he knows a lot, and he knows the Bible. He's read it cover to cover. Have you? I can promise you. Because he can quote it. He quoted it to the Son of God. He knows the Bible backwards and forwards. Christians, listen, Christians, we should know it better than him. Do we? Hmm. 
I don't know. Should we? Absolutely. Here's another thing we got to know. He can't make you do anything. The devil made me do it. When your kids say that to you, no, he did not make you do it. No, he can only present you with ideas and thoughts. It's up to you whether you act on them or not. An idea is powerful. Wouldn't you agree? Very powerful. And when it comes from, that's what temptation is. Temptation is the devil presenting in your mind an idea or thought that is not from God. Now, this is why it's so important to know the voice of God and to know the word of God. Because every idea, even if it's good, doesn't necessarily mean that it's God. Hello? Even though it might be good, doesn't mean that it's God. And so you've got to, we, we have to discern. And the way we do that is by staying connected to the Father. And then the last thing you've got to understand is he's defeated. I mean, he's a defeated foe. He's already lost. And that's the way you deal with him. So here's the last question that we want to answer is how do we fight? I think that's a good question. What are some of the tools that we have in our repertoire that we can fight the enemy? I'm just going to give you three, but there's probably dozens of different tools. These are the ones. Now, understand something. When it comes to these, these tools, they are spiritual tools. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So the weapons, check this out, if the tool of the enemy or his only way of trying to get you to follow him is thoughts and ideas, then guess what? The weapons that we have are in order to deal with those thoughts and ideas, to try to counteract those thoughts and ideas. The first one he wants you to write down is community. You say, well, how is that spiritual? It's very spiritual. Now, I have a bucket list. I don't know if you have one, but I have a bucket list. I have it in my notes I keep adding to it. I keep subtract, subtracted from it. There's lots of things that I want to do in my life. And one of them is to go on a safari. I want to go on a safari. Anybody ever been on a safari? Raise your hand if you've ever been on a safari. Send your pastor on one one day. I can't wait to go. I, I want to go. And so I've done a lot, quite a bit of study. I love watching nature shows. And I love watching shows where animals eat other animals. It is, I love it. It's amazing. Uh, don't get offended. It happens in the real world. <clears throat> and so one of the things that they tell you when you ever go on a safari is that you have to, you, you get in a truck, and whenever you come to a pride of lions, okay, whenever you get, and I've told this story before, whenever you get to a pride of lions, they tell you no matter what happens, no matter how close the lions come to the truck, no matter how nice they seem, no matter what, if they come and rub themselves against the truck, if they get near the truck, you're going to be scared. Do not get out of the truck. Whatever you do, do not get out of the truck. Because when the lion sees the truck, he sees something that's bigger than he is, and he's not going to attack it. If you and your little self get out of that truck and decide to run, you're going to be on a television show that I watch on Sunday afternoons. The Bible says, that the devil's like a roaring lion. The Bible says that he is the accuser of the brethren. He wants you to get out of the truck. He wants you to get out of community. And he's going to do anything he can to get you to separate from your church. He's going to do everything he can. Look at your neighbor say, don't get out of the truck. How do you stay in the truck? You deal with stuff. How do you stay in the truck? You go to people and you talk to them about problems. How do you stay in the truck? You don't let the devil divide you because that's what he wants to do. He wants to divide you. 
He'll tell, he'll tell you that white people don't like black people and black people don't like white people and Republicans don't like Democrats. So why don't you go to another church that looks exactly like you and why don't you go to a church that's not gonna put pressure on you? Why don't you go to a church, go to, he wants you to get out of the truck. Or don't, you know what? Just don't even go to church and watch Joel on Sunday mornings. I love Joel. This is my Bible. I love Joel. I love Joel. But you need to be in church every single weekend. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, don't get out of the truck. <laughs> Psalms 133, verse 1. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. Is it easy? No. Are there Christians you're not going to like? Yes. There's some that I don't like. And they go here. <laughs> just being honest. Some of them, no, I don't want to say that. I'll just leave that alone. I, I mean, I love everybody, but that doesn't mean I have to like them. They're going to get on my nerves, but I still have a responsibility to pray for them. I still have a responsibility to forgive them. I still have a responsibility not to attack them. Look, church, don't talk about other, other trucks. Don't attack other trucks. Don't attack other drivers. Are you following what I'm saying? I'm talking about pastors and other churches. There's great churches in Charlotte. Phenomenal churches. God gives us all kinds of different trucks. I'm going to preach a message on how to leave the truck. Because there is a way to get into another truck the right way. And sometimes when you know, God does lead you out. It happens all the time. But listen, however you leave a place is going to determine how you enter the next. Always. Always. All right, here's the second thing. I go on all day. The Word of God. Word of God. I got three minutes. The Word of God. The Word of God. Now, you heard recently in one of the messages that we've been given the sword of the Spirit as part of our uniform. But let me tell you another part of the Word of God that's important. And, he, and Jesus uses it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus said to him, when, he, when Satan came to him and Satan quoted Scripture to him, Jesus responded with, it is written. He said over and over, it is written. The devil, listen to me, let me tell you something about the devil in quoting scripture. He will never quote the full context of the scripture. He will always pick pieces of it out because he can't quote the full scripture. Jesus came back with the true scripture, the full word of God, the full counsel of God. So here's the thing about the word of God. It is a weapon for you to use, but it also is a defense for you as well. The Bible says one of the part of our armor is the shield of faith. When Paul talked about that shield, he wasn't talking about a metal shield, he was talking about a wooden shield because most people couldn't afford a metal shield. They had wooden shields. And it says that it will quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. What is he talking about? Well, what they would do before every battle is they would take that shield and they would dunk it in water overnight, leave it there, so that when in the morning when they woke up, it was completely covered and saturated in the water that it was dunked in. And so when the fiery darts were sent, these fiery darts that were set on fire would hit the shield. They would be quenched by the wetness that was on the shield of faith. So your shield of faith, when you dunk it and soak in the word of God and the enemy tries to present those thoughts and ideas... The word of God that you are saturated with will quench every fiery dart that comes against you. Now, the only way that happens is if you spend time in the word of God every single day. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Now, I'm a in the morning person because I think you need to tune the instruments before the symphony. So for me, I read the Bible in the morning. Find a time, read it, study it, spend time in it. Start, for, start with three minutes and then build up to five minutes and 10 minutes and 15 minutes and whatever you need to do in order to take your shield of faith, soak it in the word of God so that when the enemy comes to attack you, you can quench all the fiery darts. And then here's the last one is worship. Everybody say worship. worship. Now worship is more than a slow song. Now I know what we would all love. We would all love for Leslie... Leslie, to show up at your house tomorrow morning. 
So you wake up. So instead of the alarm comes on, there's Leslie at the end of your bed, and she's playing like this. Wouldn't that be great? That ain't going to happen. But worship is way more than a slow song. And I think sometimes we, we bring worship only to music. Worship is your life. It's your life. It's your life. It's, worship is being generous to people that you'll never see. Like what we're doing with Short, Short Creek. You're never going to meet that lady. More than likely. You're never going to meet that lady that got ministered to by your generosity. That's what worship is. Worship is loving the unlovely. Worship is forgiving somebody who you think deserves revenge. Worship is, is serving when you're hurting yourself. That's what worship is. Wor- worship is, is giving. Worship, worship I, like to, I like to define it this way. Worship is the act of gratitude for what God is doing and has done in my life. It's the act of gratitude. See, here's the thing you got to know. Why don't you stand up with me, and I'll, I'll close with this thought. Worship is reprioritizing your life and putting God number one in every area of your life. Not just, don't, you don't compartmentalize him and put him over here. He's, he's for Sunday. No, he's for Monday through Saturday, too. He's for your job. He's for your school. He's for your family. He's for your marriage. He's for your friendships. And he wants to be first in every one of those areas. You will never be able to do all that God wants you to do and all the world says you should do. I'm going to say that one more time because I want you to hear this. You will never be able to do, you'll never be able to do all that God wants you to do and all the world says you should do, which means you're going to have to, all of us are going to have to reprioritize our life in order to put God first because you'll never be able to do everything the world says you should do. And so it means you may have to have some conversations with your kids' schools. You may have to have some conversations with your kids' coaches. You may have to have some conversations with your work in order to put God back at first in your life. Because you'll never be able to do all that God wants you to do and all the world says you should do. So I want you to close your eyes just for a minute. I just want to, just a simple question in closing today. Do you need to reprioritize? Because that's what worship is. Saying, God... Forgive me for you not being first in this area. Do you have some areas that God is not first in your life? Maybe he's not first overall and you need to decide, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. You're not voting him in, you're inviting him in. You invite him, say, Jesus, come in. I want you to take over in my life. I need your help. I need need your forgiveness. I, I need your healing. I need your direction. I need your guidance. I need your truth. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Or maybe you have an area of your life that you've put God second, third, fourth, fifth. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your family. I don't know. Hey, look, we all, we all can sometimes kind of get out of place and, and, and end up putting ourselves in a position where God's not first. So here's one. If, if you say, just honest, between you and God, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you say, you know what, Pastor Troy, maybe watching online, you know what, Pastor Troy, God's not first in this area. I want you just to raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. Thank you for being honest today. Thank you so much. Keep it up high so I can see it. If you raised your hand, I just want you to pray this prayer. Church, join with them. Keep your hand up. We're going to make a confession to put Jesus Lord, and then we're going to deal with that area. Just say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that his blood washes me, forgives me. I believe that his resurrection sets me free to live a new life. Today, I give my life to you. Today, I adjust my priorities. God, Jesus, 
Holy Spirit, I want you to be number one in my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us for online services. If you'd like to learn more about Freedom House or how you can become part of our church, visit our website at freedomhouse.cc.